this is a fascinating panel. We are happy to have a pretty diverse group of speakers, and each of them is representing a certain phase or certain stage of civil society. Their lives represent it. We have Martin Palos, who probably thanks to his family background, was active in civil society even from his childhood. He is a friend of Asab Havel. He was one of the signatories of Charter 77 and then one of the spokesmen. He is a philosopher. It's quite natural that he was one of the key figures in uh, Prague Civic Forum. And later on, he also became the politician and a diplomat. And Martin worked in the era of Samizdat. I'm afraid the young generation even doesn't know what does it mean. Those were the times when the critical voices, dissidents, had to type and copy their reflections about society and disseminate them. Michael Anti has emerged as a the strong character in a completely different era, even in, in, even in the context of technology. It means he doesn't need to type, write, and to copy because his tool <laughs> is internet. He is one of the most influential bloggers in his country. He's a well-known reporter and journalist. He knows a lot about the relationships between freedom on the internet and civil society, and we'll be pleased to hear his reflections about it. Danuta Glondis is an educator who for 20 years was involved in shaping new forms of culture in Krakow. But moreover, she is also a sort of maître d'hôtel at a fascinating place called Villa Decius in Krakow, a place for meetings, gatherings, talks, and encounters, especially of young people from different regions of the world and of Europe, especially of Eastern Europe, and in a way, she is a person who does precisely what His Holiness Dalai Lama was emphasizing. It means to help young people to find their voice and to help them to express what are their perspectives on the future, what are their perspectives of 21st, hopefully better century. She works with young people and they are happy to come to Villa Decius. Leopold Lopez comes from Venezuela a country which has attracted the world attention because of its people, because of its problem, because of its politician. And he is a young leader who has a three heads. He's an economist, he's a politician involved in politics, in party politics, and at the same time, he's a strong civic actor. He's a hope for a new Venezuela, and he is a hope for new patterns also for other Central and Southern American countries and not only there. So we will be very glad to, to listen to him. This panel, however, is unique because instead of words, we could hear songs. Both words and songs from a legend, the international voice of freedom, liberty, and human rights. I think Joan Baez certainly doesn't need introduction, and it is not possible because it would take at least half of this panel. With her, this panel is connected with Václav Havel. I will never forget that evening in Bratislava 25 years ago. Communists still were holding very firmly their power. She came to a concert in Bratislava. She was able to smuggle Václav on the balcony of that hall. She told the organizers that he's carrying, you know, her instruments. And then she introduced him to the enthusiastic audience. It was like a bomb there. <laughs> and the horrified organizers switch off the lights, and then came miracle. Uh, Joan Baez started to sing without microphone. It was absolute silence. It was single sweet chariot. 
we all had goosebumps, and we were absolutely convinced that the change is coming. So, please welcome our panelists. We will start with three questions. I'd like to ask our panelists to briefly respond or to briefly talk about three topics. And again, these are not tough instructions, so they can modify it, they can respond in a way they would like, but I think at least these three aspects are of interest for many people who are involved in civil society. The first, the first is certain contradiction uh, between the legitimacy of civil society actors. Those people who are strong protagonists of representative democracy, it means of parties, they are often criticizing civil society actors because they are asking, uh, who elected you? You are not elected. How it comes that you aspire to become the leaders? How it comes that you want to participate? Uh, you do not have legitimacy for it. So this is the contradiction or conflict between representative and participatory democracy. In this part of the world, in Central Europe, in Czech Republic, in Czechoslovakia, there were two strong protagonists. Our Czech friends know it very well. President Václav Klaus was a strong protagonist of representative democracy. He was ridiculing civic activism as NGOism and other isms. And our dear Václav Havel obviously was the person who was very much and strongly in favor of independent civic actors. So this is the first question, how the panelists see it now. The second is about what do they think, which form, which type of activity of civil society is in their country, in their region, or worldwide at this time important and useful and needed? Because sometimes the civil society acts as a wall against different sorts or forms of authoritarianism. Sometimes it is a laboratory of innovation. It is a resource for reforms and for policies. Sometimes it's a last resort for those underprivileged who are trying to find a voice. Someone is expressing their aspirations, their desires. Sometimes it provides services which the state doesn't want or doesn't, or doesn't know how to do. So which of those types do you think is important? And finally, the final question is a question of the coalitions and compromises. Uh, some people say that uh, s many civil society activists are aspiring for moral high. They do not like compromises. They want that politics should be 100% clean, and they really want a lot. As the, one of the previous panel, Magda Vasharyova, was talking about this, uh, this phenomenon of high aspirations. At the same time, to achieve a change, it is necessary to enter coalitions. In South America, for instance, there were coalitions with the trade unions, with church, with political parties in order to achieve change. Where is the frontier between the compromise and the necessity for a change. So these are three questions, and I would like to ask Martin Palos to start, Michael Antti to continue, then Danuta, then Leopoldo, and then Joan Baez. You have between five to seven minutes, three, five, seven, eight minutes, each of you, please. Uh, not, not too much, but not too little, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your attention, Martin, please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Martin. Uh, you. Uh, know me for some time, and you know that as a civil society activist, I uh, have a tendency not to be uh, entirely disciplined. And the older I am, the more rigid I am. And because I've prepared uh, some uh, remarks and notes, I will try to put, if you see your permission, in my time limit, your questions into my conceptual scheme, which I have prepared for this meeting. We had a very beautiful uh, uh, panel um, before with Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, uh, the clerk and others, uh, I consider myself to be almost in a political seminar of classical political philosophy discussing forms of government. Uh, we have good uh, and bad governments that is uh, uh, taught by Aristotle already. We have uh, governments defined by how many rules we have, one, few, or many. 
And what has come to my mind is that we also need to discuss forms of civil society uh, to be uh, seen as a complementary element uh, to our discussion. Because civil society, in my view, is a, con a concept that can generate a lot of confusions uh, if we don't distinguish these forms. Uh, I will use my forms uh, as I have experienced them in my life, because this would be a much broader topic if taken seriously and academically. I started, as uh, Martin said, as a dissident. So first form of civil society is a civil society that can emerge or is emerging uh, in a society under stress. I already heard uh, here Cuban uh, dissidents uh, who are now here to participate in this beautiful discussion. Uh, speaking about democratization in Cuba means to take into consideration that you have society that has been devastated very significantly by the form of government it had. Uh, corruption, uh, the, um, uh, everybody had to coordinate him herself with that situation. So we have this type of civil society connected with Charter 77, most likely inspired by the text like Václav Havel's Power of Powerless, believing that individual self-esteem responsibility is maybe more than um, uh, your success in a society. And we could speak about that uh, for a long time, and I think that in all countries that struggle with totalitarian regime, uh, they would have this experience. So this would be where Václav Havel, uh, first one, is coming from. Then the second, uh, I would say, typus is civil society in moment of revolutionary action. This is our experience of 1989. We were all surprised how, how quickly we uh, were able to get together to uh, a certain action. This action has been, has been, was using very symbolic and simple forms. This is what you have here, keys. Uh, and it was a unity that was uh, driven by the topography where the revolution was uh, taking place, squares. You have it till today, people gathering on the squares and displaying some unity that can be effective in a certain moment. This was a situation in which Václav Havel met with Václav Klaus. I still have a vivid memory, the moment when, when he appeared in one of these first meetings of Civic Forum. And then is obviously civil society as to be discussed as a part of uh, processes that start after revolution. Uh, you can think about discourse about civic so civil society in which obviously you can have uh, different participants such as Klaus with his uh, mantra of standard uh, uh, solutions, uh, standard uh, uh, democracy, and also first generation uh, revolutionaries like Václav Havel. This uh, clash, the interface between second and third type of uh, discourse on, uh, of, uh, on civil society is very interesting and needs still to be very properly explored. In this third context, we have discourse on civil society. Here, obviously, we need to uh, remind ourselves, I already uh, several times heard this uh, uh, in these two days, uh, uh, mentioned uh, Ralph Darndorf with his classical book. In his classical book, obviously, civil society is quite good in saying no to something. Uh, negative power of revolution, inspired by the uh, outrage of people and their desire to get some sort of dignity, and then what is uh, needed as an architectonic power of institution building. So in this uh, first moment, some sort of negotiated settlement is possible, but then fight uh, starts, and maybe it has to, had to start, between those who believe in standard political systems and others. And out of sudden, we have civil society transformed into uh, intermediary bodies of civil society in a classical uh, terminology let's say, NGOs that can do this or that. And obviously there you have a question that these NGOs can easily cooperate with government in certain things, maybe being better in uh, distributing social uh, uh, services and all sorts of things, or sometimes reminding government that something is getting wrong. So I think that uh, both, uh, in all our discussion, we need to have these distinctions in consideration. Last point, open society. I was kind of surprised that I haven't heard this concept here mentioned at all. This was uh, the key 
uh, word, obviously brought in also by Darndorf and his uh, uh, teacher, Karl Popper, uh, open society, society that has certain quality that totalitarian societies don't have. What qualities he meant? Capacity for self-reflection, capacity for self-transformation, and belief that politics is, as he said somewhere, open hypothesis to be tested in the light of experience against reality. Uh, it is a society that obviously can make mistakes, but can learn from mistakes, can be, transform mistakes into, I would say, very useful part of uh, um, a political process. And in that respect, civil society plays a very important role because it is not driven as political parties are and their leaders especially by the, uh, this f short cycle and need to succeed. It is here to be responsible, I would say, for noetic element, for our ability to understand. Because uh, in the process in which uh, we are part of, things go fast. And what we need is understanding. And understanding is, I think, the quality uh, that is what uh, makes our efforts also legitimate. <clears throat> Thank you, Martin. We heard an introduction <laughs> of a man who has both a legacy of, as a practitioner and who is also a philosopher. As I said, Martin started to work in times of Samizdat. Michael Anti doesn't need to copy and to typewrite because he's using another tool and he's living in an incredibly interesting part of the world and we are all eager to hear your testimony. Yeah. I think to understand Chinese civil society, you should understand one, uh, one story. So there is the duck house. So there is one lamp there. The light is under the lamp. But the other, the rest of the house, is in the dark. The only one man is seeking, looking for something. People ask, what are you looking for? He said, I looking, want to find my nair. But people ask, there is obviously no nair, no nair there. Why you still keep finding under the lamp? Because he answered, because the only <laughs> there, there is light. Because China, why people in the last de 22 decades keep saying, keep doing civil society? Because that's the only thing we can do. If you, if you cannot be in a country without election, without freedom of press, the only thing you can do is civil society. Because civil society, is a modern term, tiger without teeth for the, for the government. It's supposed to be tolerant by the government because it did not create a real threat for a you know, confidence government. That's the original civil society, the intention in China, because you cannot do something in China. You cannot organize the protest. You cannot organize a political party. You cannot have your own media. So basically, you can do civil society to, for example, her, help the women, ch children, and do the environment, the, the NGO things. But that's the only thing you can, uh, you can, you can do. <coughs> that's the very beginning. But at the same time, the internet comes. Internet really is something, I think, is a gift <coughs> given by the God to the Chinese people. i just give you one simple example to show. Everyone is treated. Tweeting now, right? So you know Twitter. Twitter have a limitation for the characters. You can only have 140 characters <laughs> in one tweet, right? But remind you, Chinese characters are different with English letters. 140 English letter characters means 20 words. It's almost like a, a sentence or two sentences or a sentence with a link. For the 140 character characters, that means a story in Chinese. <laughs> it had the four things. So I did really uh, research. I, I calculate. <laughs> I just look. I find Chinese tweeting has 3.6 times of inform information volume than English tweets. <laughs> That's the reason when the social media came to China, it immediately become a personal media private media. 
So Chinese people regard as blog is not only something online. It's like something as private media. Everyone now have a chance have media. And I'll tell you how many internet users can have the media in China. There is 600 million internet users. 600 million. How many people use social media? That means tweeting or microblogging. 300 million. It's almost the entire population of the United States. Think, 300 million people, everyone has an individual media. What is, so this kind of thing is, in the, in the world background, is really internet help civil society because people can communicate, right? But when the internet comes to China, it really empowered the tiger without teeth to have teeth. <laughs> because it's no more a communication tool. It become media. China lack of the real freedom of speech and freedom of press. But given the internet, so fast communication speed. Nowadays, Chinese people start to utilize, to, to, to get used to the civil society, the Western society already enjoyed in 1950s. But now we happen to just now experience. So you can see the energy to create it from the internet society. But this also created a problem because once we think civil society is the tiger without teeth, government should tolerate. But now the internet empowered the tiger. So the government is more, little bit afraid of this new tiger with teeth. Mm -hmm. So you can see new measure made by the government to continue crack down the blogging. Why? Because everyone know, noticed the power that created from the new thing. Sometimes Chinese also very, Chinese nations are all very strange nation. <coughs> even given, even the character self can create the miracle. But but also, when we talk about the, uh, the, 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 the civil society, I, also, I want to tell you the big debate happened inside China. We continue people support civil society. Almost everyone support civil society inside China. Also, the reformist uh, officials in the government support civil society. But the question will be, why we only do civil society? Why would not cross the line? But the answer is very simple. You cannot cross the line. That's a very dangerous thing. So there will be very, a lot of scholars now justify this conveniency. From the very beginning, to, to do only civil society is the compromise, right? Because oh, I cannot do something. It's self-censorship. But continually, Chinese scholars think, maybe we do not do first the political thing, we first do civil society thing, maybe it's good. Look at Egypt, right? Lack of civil society, if you quickly get to the democracy, maybe it's just a chaotic thing. But the other side of the Chinese scholar thing, no. Have you ever seen any chance that in a non-democratic society, civil society will quickly get booming? No, because without basic political participatory structure. There are even no, no hope for civil society. That means even with the support with the internet, without political reform support, civil, civil society eventually will be the tiger without teeth. So my hope is very simple. We have internet. As a blogger, every day I fight for the freedom of speech inside China. But also, civil society in the internet it's also the life, c'est la vie. I earn money from internet writing. I write columns. And I, 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 from in the last two decades, I never got any money from the institution, I mean, from the system. Nowadays, more and more young people living in the society, civil society. Society is no more, in the 20 years ago, like a compromise tour, compromise step. Now, since civil society become very important uh, part of the young people who every day only get news, not from TV, not from news, the, the newspaper. They only get news from very cheap Chinese copycat of cell phones. <laughs>
You know, this cell phone is Android with G Gmail, but only 100 US dollar. It's very good. So I love the copycat of thing because they give the poor young Chinese people an individual Chinese dream that maybe we can live in the way that our parents didn't live because our parents should live with the system. But maybe in this chance, we can use with the market, with the globalization, with the internet, we can live in a different way. We may fear, but at least we deserve a try. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. It's fascinating, especially this image of the internet has empowered the tiger <laughs> and also this emerging of independence. Tanuta, what is empowering young people whom you are meeting at your villa? That's you, and at your 20 years of educating them, meeting them, and helping them finding a voice. Uh, I think it is hope for a better future and for a peaceful future. And it is the hope for collaboration which has never existed in this part of, of Europe, uh, I mean Central Eastern Europe, and the hope for peaceful cohabitation uh, between our countries, uh, which were very often in conflict. I'm speaking about Central Eastern Europe countries. But uh, let me also react on this uh, legitimacy of civil society, because I'm, I'm quite surprised to, to defend civil society here in Prague, uh, with Václav Havel you know, at the back, um, without, uh, I don't know, people who, who question uh, legitimacy of civil society question democracy. Because we are not only the component of democracy, but we made the democracy. Without civil society, without, without citizens, not inhabitants of the countries, citizens of, of the countries, there would never be democratic system here. There is a difference between inhabitant and a citizen, passive, active, uh, subject to the power, creating the power making the change. So uh, I understand that we can be annoying to the, to the politicians, to those who have power and who have money, because we not only uh, act very frequently much better than the state-run uh, institutions, than the government institutions or city institutions, but we also watchdog what the authorities are doing. And we are not afraid to say in public that we don't like lack of transparency, uh, political decisions, and fooling the society, not only us, but the society with some promises. So um, this, is, this is really uh, worrying that we now, 25 years after the transformation, uh, have to defend civil society, have to defend components of democracy, which, yeah, which are here. Uh, you mentioned open society. Yes, Leszek Kowakowski in his famous Modernity on, and the Trial wrote that the basics of the, the basic condition of the open society is spiritual freedom, but not meaning the instrumental, the, the governmental freedom, but the freedom which comes from, from the inside, from the community. And, and he believed in the, in the rational, in the, in the reason of the community and in the... Uh, rights to make mistakes also when we uh, when performing the activities so the hope the hope for the future uh, depends on the on our relations with authorities in fact maybe i will stop here because i don't want to consume all your time yeah. okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I was just thinking that there is another element, perhaps, uh, which can be conceptualized like, yes, here we have civil society, and here we have something what can be called as uncivil society. Unfortunately, there are traditions in the 30s in Italy and Germany, and there are traditions also now. So the far-right extremist movements are also, or are not, a part of civil society, so this is also the big question mark which we also have 
to have in mind. Leopoldo, we touched Central Europe. We were for a moving moment in China. We are now swimming to your part of the world, and yeah. we are eager to hear your testimony about civil society and your role and perspectives in. Gracias. Um, the question is, if civil society is still a force for change, of course, it's, it's the people is a force of change, and civil society is the people. The question in, of the concept civil society, I think, came after the idea that civil society was only represented by NGOs, and that limited the idea of, of civil society, because it became a structural way of understanding civil society. So if that questioning was uh, a logical questioning. Only those that are capable of putting together an NGO can be so-called civil society, and that, of course, brought about an entire debate. I come from Venezuela, and in Venezuela, over the past 15 years, there has been a gradual process of dismantling democracy. Dismantling democracy as we know it for two pillars, basic pillars. The one, the legitimacy of the votes, and the second, which was uh, discussed in the earlier panel, the legitimacy of how democracy works. That has many things. The equilibrium between the different powers of the state, respect for human rights, um, freedom of speech, human dignity as the goal of democracy. All those issues have been dismantling progressively in Venezuela with the idea that those that were governing were governing with the support of the people because they were winning elections. 18 elections in 14 years. That was a half-truth up until last April when we won the election and the government actually stole the election as the last panel also said happens in democracies, in some democracies with bad governments. The idea of civil society for us is key in the Venezuela that we have today. My friend Antonio Gonzalez, I think he's here from Cuba, this morning he asked a question and he said, how do we bring about change if there is a fragmentation between the state and the individual? And everything that is between the state and the individual is fragmented. It has been blown away. Everything, universities, uh, unions, student movements, it has been either or paralleled by the government with a parallel institution or taken away as illegal or basically dismantled. So that's the reality that we're facing. So how do we bring about change? Change has to do with an idea. Change in itself is not forceful enough. It's not committing enough to have millions of people go to the streets or go out to vote. So we need to have a clear idea of what change is about. And what we have been putting together through our alliance of political parties and social uh, organizations called the Unity, or our own political party that's called uh, People's Will, is a very simple idea. Very old, very uh, talked about, but not brought about to a reality, at least in our country. All rights for all the people. Very simple, but very powerful. All the rights, not part of the rights, for all the people. And for us, that's the common thread that all the fights of different groups of people, of different individuals, can find in a society that has to fight against the power of the state. Because that's the only way in which people with very different origins, very different realities, and very different interests can, bring, can be brought about together. The interest of the fishermen from the coast that is being taken away the opportunity to go out and fish because of a new law, or the interest of the producers of the plains that have been expropriated, or the interest of a reporter that has been kicked away from the TV channel because of his political position, or the owner of the media that has been expropriated, or the interest of the gay and lesbian groups that are fighting for recognition. If you look at that spectrum, all those issues are very, very different from each other. But one thing they have in common, one thing, they are all fighting for a specific right, either for the right of freedom of speech, or the right of property, or the right of recognition, or the right for marriage, or the right for work, or the right for having uh, health care, or education, or housing, or a environment. 
So that one thing that for each individual or group can be very different from each other has to become in our way of understanding the, the counterweight that we need to build against a very powerful and even more powerful when you have oil at $110 per barrel and you have an oil country, that one idea that all the people are brought together by their common defense of their rights is a very powerful idea. Because then we can say, we are fighting for you. It doesn't matter what right, specific right we represent. We need to make the idea that all the people are fighting for all the people's rights. And that idea becomes very powerful when you put together the workers with the students, with the people that have been affected by the media, with the producers. And they all understand that even though they may have different origins, even though they may have different ways of understanding the future, the only way they can picture a common future is by picturing that future in terms of the rights. So then comes another question. Well, how, what type of society is a society that is capable of delivering all the rights for all the people? Mm. And I don't want to go into the depth of uh, all the issues that are being discussed in this forum, but I want to signal out three issues that are key. The first is we need to compromise with good government, efficient government. It's not enough to have a good constitution. There was a debate in the previous panel. I had a conversation with Mr. De Klerk this morning, and he was telling me that their fight was for a new system that had to be reflected in a new constitution. That's not the problem that we have in Venezuela. We have a good constitution. All the rights are expressed in the constitution, in paper. All the rights are supposedly defended by the institutions that are also in, in, the, in, in that constitution. But the reality is very different. So the reality to make all the rights for all the people needs an efficient government that has accurate political and public policies to deliver what the aspirations of those rights are in the Constitution. But that's not enough. Because that could mean the rights for part of the people. In order to have all the rights for all the people, you need a judiciary system, you need justice. That it's nothing less than all the rights are equal to all the people. So if you have a system that is not a democracy, you will not have all individuals being equal versus their own rights. So that's the second key issue in order to bring about a government or a system where all the rights for all the people are respected. And the third that is very common for us, or it's very, um, very close to our reality being in the opposition to a very autocratic government, is the will to fight for the rights. The will to fight. The will to defend the rights. The will to agitate the conscience of the people in order for those that don't recognize that their rights are being taken away, those rights to become the source of their action. No, it's not enough to be indignado, to be, I don't know how you say that word in English, to be Indignant. pissed off. Pissed off. To be, huh? That's a, that's off, a translation. Yeah. translation. Yeah. It's, it's, we, it's necessary. A Spanish make, niche here. Yeah. <laughs> to make the change towards action. We need to make that sense of not being capable of doing anything into action. And that's, of course, in the realm of civil society. And in order to, uh, two, three other ideas, very quick. Force, how can we make the civil society a force, a strong force? I think there are three key elements. The first is that it needs to have a tangible and a timely proposal, tangible. It's not, we cannot have an abstract proposal, a better world, everybody wants a better world. Communists and capitalists, they all promote a better world. We need to promote something very tangible, something that people can see. Uh, that means a better housing system, or that means a healthcare system, or an education system that allows you to progress, or public safety, tangible things that you're willing to fight for. And timely, timely. Why timely? Because in order for these groups of civil society to activate, Change needs to be in the short-term horizon. Uh, and, and I think this is part of the discussion that we need to have, because I think that there are different positions around the time horizon issue uh, hearing different speakers this morning. I believe that we need to present a short-term time horizon in order for the people to take risks. People will not take risks 
for a fight that is in the long term. People will not risk their lives in my country. We are risking our lives. I have been threatened in many ways. I have had murder attempts. I have been uh, threatened to be in prison, as many others. So in order to take risk, that change needs to be tangible. The second is the capacity to communicate. And I think that Michael was talking about this, this new revolution of the way we can communicate. But that communication, it's also not enough. And goes to the third issue, which is the grassroots organization. Grassroots organization is key. And we may be in an age where the media creates a sensation of grassroots organized society. But we cannot be uh, flashed away by the Twitter or the 2.0 or the social media that that's equal to grassroots organization. Grassroots organization needs to people touching people, needs people talking to people, needs people in specific places doing specific things. And I think that is something that we need to promote permanently, that we need to focus uh, strategically as a source for change. So those are some of the thoughts on civil society as definitely, definitely a force for change. Thank you. Tangible things, people touching people, and everything what you said is so inspiring. And, and also, if we are looking to the body language that our friends yeah. from China and Venezuela and our friends from Central Europe, you see that I would say there is, a, there is a, some difference in, in, in the way how, how we look at the things. I do not have more words because now the floor is for John Weiss. <laughs> we need you in the States. <laughs> <laughs> we really do. Thank you, John. That's exciting to hear to hear the commitment. And it's also exciting to hear uh, talking about grassroots because that gets lost. Uh, it's exciting to hear about risk because risk became a word like sacrifice that kind of vanished for a number of years. Um, well, we preoccupied ourselves with other things. Um, in fact, risk is the main problem in much of the organizing and the ideas and the groups that are willing to act up to a point, but not to take the risk beyond that. And without the risk, there will not be the social change that we're looking for. And that risk is what makes the Havels of the world and the Ansan Suchis of the world, I think, that they've taken that great risk and they don't consider it a sacrifice. It was just the obvious thing to do to try and create uh, a good society. I'm confused about the expression civil society because when I first heard it, it reminded me of, well, first of all, Aung San Suu Kyi said it about that she preferred to use good governance because good government might be a contradiction in terms. And then I remembered when somebody asked Mahatma Gandhi what he thought of Western civilization, he said he thought it was a good idea. But obviously, and, and so civil society struck me. But I'm also, I'm not a cautious optimist. I'm more of a pessimist. But I've managed to do the things I've done throughout my life. Anyway, um, we all respond to the questions by whatever images come to our minds. And mine throughout all of this talking has been probably closest to talking about grassroots because I've always felt and the things I've sought out in my lifetime to do where I was comfortable and I knew I would make the best use of myself and my voice were all to do with the work at the bottom of the pyramid. And that the higher you got to that top power, the less possibility you had to make real change. And uh, for instance, right now in the States, um, the, we had this inspired, magnificent Obama, but, people felt a togetherness that we hadn't felt in 40 years. Um, and then when he got into that office, which is the top of the pyramid, it became almost impossible to do anything. And now, um, and then having worked with Dr. King, where it really stayed, I mean, he was smart enough not to run for president. People tried to get him to run for president, and he was intuitive, I think, enough to know that his power would be over. 
And so um, mostly I'm familiar with and all on a foundation of nonviolence, which I had from a very early age, is trying to move that pyramid around from the bottom. And by the organizing and risk taking and understanding your own society as opposed to somebody else's because they're not all exactly alike. Um, one slightly optimistic thought at the moment in the States is that the American public for the first time that I've ever known has responded to uh, the issue of should we or should we not bomb Syria um, by actually looking at the question and concluding for the most part that it's not a very good idea. And that's really, that's a big step for us. Um, so I, I would just say, for me, in general, with all the things that we're going to talk about and all the things at the, whole, at the forum and any discussions I get in with young people, that my motto is little victories and big defeats. Because if we recognize that we're in a, in a world of huge defeats and power that's out of control, et cetera, it almost seems as though every little victory we have becomes more important that that's what will define our lives and our times and to be as decent as possible and to pursue until there's another time when we have the cohesiveness that we had um, in the 60s and the 70s and people in the States, people are yearning for that. Well, you had, what did we have? We had a, a sense of each other. We had a sense of community and we haven't had that for a long time, and I call the long time in the meantime. And whatever happens at the end of the meantime will really reflect whatever we've been doing during the meantime. So those are the little victories when we work hard for them, I think. So blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much. <laughs> These are the words of the person who started with Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine what an incredible long era of involvement. I think there is almost no issue, let it be environmental, human rights, rights of different groups, et cetera, et cetera, which, which you were not involved in, in the times of, of your activity. And, and I think two concepts which you emphasize this cohesiveness and the sense of community, which, which is the fruitful legacy of the 60s and 70s. And let me say one thing the Dalai Lama said about commitment. When somebody said, well, you have commitment, what next? And he said, enthusiasm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, if our panelists would like to respond briefly to, to uh, the other panelists, so floor is yours, but then in this case, having, you know, representatives from like Joan Baez and Venezuela and China and, and Danuta and Martin, I would like to uh, give more space for the questions or comments from the audience. So first the panelists, if you would like to comment or to add something. Uh, if I may, uh, maybe a, a little bit of provocation. Uh, I don't think that uh, bodies of civil society here are always uh, uh, to enforce certain changes. They might be also in a situation that they want to prevent certain changes from happening. Uh, just remembering the history of our country and going back uh, to the late 40s, students might be also trying to protest on the streets uh, against uh, certain tendencies uh, that uh, were driven forward by some movements with intention to accelerate the history and to realize certain goals. So uh, what I would like to say is that there is uh, civil society uh, can be uh, very important, maybe um, uh, not only accelerator, but also uh, to, uh, to send warning uh, calls too. And uh, what I would like to uh, get also is uh, there must be always tension in a democratic society between standard structures of uh, uh, political system, let's say political parties uh, and their role in the parliament, and then the voices coming from civil society, and they can be both. 
sometimes uh, very much against uh, uh, certain tendencies of political parties. Sometimes they can complement the activities nicely of uh, the system. So I would like to a little bit de-ideologize uh, this discussion and uh, find a little bit more balance here because sometimes too much of enthusiasm can be a bad thing too and a generation of uh, uh, some me of certain members or participants in Charter 77 uh, that before that had to wake themselves up from the intoxication of ideology also is an important lesson. Thank you, Michael. Yes, I think it, it raised, Martin raised a very interesting question. I think, uh, just like a very brief introduction about Chinese civil society, but of course people in China discuss very deep. For example, civil society is supposed to be a mechanism to support the uh, stability of the society, right? It should civil society because the self-governing, then help, people help each other. But if the civil society is built within an authoritarian country. Sometimes the civil society themselves, the middle class, civil society middle class, also against the change. Because if there is some dramatic change happened in this regime, they will be the law, uh, they will have a loss, loss. Because they are middle class. They are not gr grassrooted uh, poor yeah. people. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in, a, in a authoritarian countries, I don't think the poor people started the civil society. It should be the middle class in between. But the dilemma is the middle class also against more dramatic change. So that, that, that would be also the debate happened inside China. Sometimes it looks like too compromised civil society, for example, to care about the, the, the sp uh, uh, stability of the society, sometimes against more political change. That, that would be, so that's the reason People, some people in China say the civil society is a false hope. Mm -hmm. And also, it raises another question, the timing of the democracy. Why we need democracy now? Everybody talk about Syria democracy, Egypt democracy. Why? Because these countries are create, is a troublemaker in the international community. They are making trouble in the, inter, in the world. But nobody talking about the democracy now in the Saudi area. No, nobody talking about North Korea. Because why? Because North Korea, even they have the problem, it's a problem within. It's not expand to outside world. We don't, outsider as an observer don't really care. So if you are observer outside a country like China, you think in the, in the river of time, China did good because 20 years ago, China was nothing, but now it's much, much, much better. So why not we just wait and sit to waiting for the next 20 years China? China. Why we need democracy now? That's the question, another question. Foreigner ask me, why you guys ask questions? My answer is very simple. This is my life. I only live in a very short window of life. My golden years, just like my 30s and 40s. If next 20 years there is no transition, that means I will not contribute my talent to this great nation. I need to contribute to this nation now. Otherwise, it's next life. I don't care about next life. So <laughs> that's the thing. As an observer, of the international observer, we always sit very conveniently to ask, the question timing, but the people inside the regime, they have a totally different idea. They need now. So the timing, so that's the reason. We're not only talk about Syria, Egypt, Egypt crisis or the, or the transition. In the future, we should continue to talk Saudi Arabia. We should let the ring run anytime. We said Martin Luther King, the voice, free at last. We should let, next time, North Korean people said in Korean languages, we are free at last. We don't need only focus the troublemakers. We should focus to every single country. Why? Because we are individual human being. We need democracy now. Why? Because I want to contri con contribute my full energy and talent to my great nation. 
Michael, who says why you, why now? Yeah. This question, I, I, I think you will never ask question because no. this question, because you are the guy to actively to yeah. need democracy. Even you already have a democracy, you need a better democracy. But you, if you talk to Western people, want to have a business with China, okay. Chinese situation is the best situation for them to deal with all the trouble they were making. There is no union. They were not to negotiate with the individual, uh, with the union workers. Mm -hmm. You like, a, it, it's so convenient at capitalism to deal with the, we have a deal with the communism because there is no union. Mm -hmm. So, but I would say China already become number two GDP. Mm -hmm. That means whatever China do will really influence the whole human being. So in that sense, I really need my nation to contribute more to the, to the world. Because every time I, people ask me only Chinese question, what is happening in China, I want next time people ask me not only about China, but also about the whole world. I don't want Chinese blogger only set her fighting for the, their own freedom. Sometimes we're also fighting for the internet freedom, not for China, but also for Snowden, for the American people who were monitored by NSA. That's the thing. We are, Connected. That's the new world. No. <laughs> Thanks. Uh -huh. No, I that took care of question, it. Thank you. Question. Question. There are questions, comments from audience. I see first hand, then I see second hand, and then I see third hand. So, uh, please, Michal Jantowski. Yes. Uh, my my question is to Joan. Uh, I, I was I was struck by what you said about. Uh, Obama, and it reminded me of uh, a, a, a seminal essay that uh, a joint friend of us who we mention quite often here wrote on the power of the powerless. And if I, if I understood you correctly, what you're basically saying is that as, as Havel sought and implemented in his life, uh, that the powerless you know, have an enormous potential of power mm -hmm. and uh, they can, at certain points of time, they can exercise it with uh, enormous yeah. consequences. And when they do, they come into power and they become powerless again. Is that kind what, what you're saying? saying yeah. <laughs> what I, w in a more positive way, what I've felt, and it's you know, it's, it won't happen in this particular case, was that with all the gifts that Obama has and had, that if he had taken that to lead or whatever you want to call it, participate in a movement, then I think he could have come as close, close to the experience we had with Dr. King as anybody could have come because of that extraordinary feeling that he produced. But, um, yeah, then they, as, as you know... <laughs> Gets, it gets, your power diminishes yeah. in office. Please, please introduce yourself. Uh, good evening. Uh, I would like to, back, uh, to get back to Michael and to his contribution uh, because uh, my name is Hila Tomash and I spent last year teaching at uh, several Chinese universities in mainland China. And uh, it was truly a remarkable experience for me because many views which are taken uh, as absolute truth uh, in Europe or United States, uh, they basically changed uh, when I got there. And uh, you were speaking about the tiger without teeth. Uh, it was, it's very close to me because I'm teaching IT law and social networks as well. And the thing is, when I was in China, I felt that, of course, social networks might be one of the tigers if you want to speak about changes and rapid changes. But when I was there, I felt that there are many, many other tigers. And actually, the society is quite open in a way that when you speak, for instance, with, uh, at the universities, uh, all the students, they are very open and they are discussing international questions, international issues, as well as national. And it's the same with teachers. It's the same with, the, let's say, the faculty administrators. And when I got to the uh, public, to the ordinary people, as well as businessmen or 
uh, even the public officials. It always depends on the circumstances, but all of the issues, they are actually discussed quite freely. So I'm thinking whether actually the China or how it is changing, because always when I was speaking, now I'm very carefully because what I've learned, and this will be my last comment uh, before I'll, I would like to ask for you, uh, is that uh, the Chinese people, they actually do not like when, when somebody come to China and lecture them how it should be done. They prefer to share the experience, as Mr. Havel said. So I am thinking, what do you think? What is the, let's say, what will be going on with the next few years or decades? How the society will change and what will actually change the so society if something would even do that in China? Thanks. An easy question, especially speaking of decades. But thanks for your reflections of visiting China, please. Yeah, thank you for visiting China. I welcome everyone to visit China. Beijing only have the problem with the air because we have a little bit of protest, but we are trying to set settle this problem. But to be fair, China is, I would not say it's totally open society, but I would say compared to so compared normal to authoritarian country is open society. So that's the reason I can talk here without, I don't think have our, we have trouble there because you can talk here, but can you talk there? I, yeah, <laughs> that, but, 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 but it's always quiet. Hey, right, you know. So. Yeah, so you can but, but China is not, the, the problem is China is always want to do more, you know, because in the, in the Asian world, China was one of the biggest power in the world. And uh, even the president himself talking about the China dreams in the, in the stage, in the world stage, that means, and also, you know that China was a big five of the UN. That means China, everyone, including the intellectuals and, and the bloggers, they're supposed to think Chinese nation should be one of the important players of the world. That's the thing we not just stop at this, this stage. Of course, I, I, I think if you don't care about political the ideas, if you just don't care about corruption, you compromise with the government, you still can live a very good life, right? But, but the problem is the Asian Chinese, especially Confucianism, tell us we should keep the consciousness inside. That means to be a good man. That's the problem for Chinese people. Even the officials in the system, they want to be a good man. That's the reason if you ask uh, the Beijing University graduate, especially the, the girls, what, what your job you want to do. Most of them will tell you, I want to do NGO. Why? Because they think it's the proper thing to do. To work for the government and the other side to work for the civil, civil society, more, than, more people choose the other things. If you let me predict about the future, even I say democracy now, but it's very active, you know, activist mindset. But if you ask the question about what's the future about China, I will answer in the same way the Western observer answer. I think it, at least in 20 years, China will get freedom. But the problem is timing. We need it faster. But definitely, China will change. Because 300 million people every day only get news from cell phone. Even the propaganda, propaganda machine like CCTV, People's Daily, they should, in their official social media account, to alert people, tonight we should have a very good, very important news. Then people will look the TV. That, if the propaganda need social media to remind people to watch TV tonight, the propaganda already collapsed. So we are in a very the turning point of a society. Which direction we will go? I think it is like tiger with teeth or without teeth. We don't know. It's like, uh, but I just want to say, with the internet, with the energy of the blogger, and also with the good guys in the system and outside system, China will get brighter future. At least we are much better than North Korea, right? So, so that's the basic. Sometimes we, North Korea existence is also important for Chinese national pride. 
because we look normal, right? So the, I visited North Korea twice. The first time when I came back from North Korea to China's border, another of my fellow team, tourist team, Ni Dang, kissed the land of China, said one word, thank Deng Xiaoping, because Deng Xiaoping opened China to the, to the global world and the market. You see, even you can control every, everybody's action and mind, but you cannot control people's heart. People can see different. People know North Korea situation is not good. We should liberate them. So everything, even our officials said, China is great system. But in their heart, they know it's not right. But this very deep consciousness is given by the teachings of ancient wisdom guys, you know, Confucius. I think it's continue this civilization will contribute to the world. Thanks. There was a question. Vitis Yurkonis, Vilnius University. So I have a, a question to, about, I'm a true believer in civil society and I do work with civil societies from Afghanistan to Belarus, from Georgia to Cuba. So, but I have a question about the help, encouragement for the civil society abroad from your native countries. So um, it was put by Michael, I guess, correctly, that to be an observer is rather easy, you know. So how can we contribute to the activists in uh, China, in Venezuela, elsewhere? I, I understand that it could be by sharing lessons learned, by the transition experience, by examples. But there's one actually very controversial phenomenon. It's like the phenomenon of money kills, right? There are a lot of funds available, European Commission, USAID, CEDA, and stuff like that. And you know, working with a country like Belarus, I know that civil society is basically killed there by the donor's money because they wouldn't do anything if they do not receive any funding. I mean, the majority of them. So how to deal with that situation? Because it's really complicated. How to have the proper balance between financing and really encouraging and growing from the grassroots to the real sustainable civil society? Thank you. Excellent question. Thanks. I think Danuta met many young people yes. from Belarus and other parts of the world to help to answer this question. Yes, in case of Belarus, it, it is a special case really in, in Europe because there is still the dictatorship there. And the problem is that the civil society is very, very weak. And um, so this refers to what I was saying, uh, the difference between the inhabitant of Belarus and the, civil cit and the, and the citizen of Belarus, you know. They are still, uh, there's still a big way, a long way in, fr in front of them. Um, how can you work with them at this stage as they are? Uh, well, f I tell you honestly, first we started with the opposition. But then, when the opposition people told us, look, we have to get our colleagues who are not really active in the opposition, uh, we have to get them involved. I said, okay. We started to invite people who are not necessarily representing regime because they don't have big powers that they are not, but they are working for the regime for some reasons. And they started to come and they joined our programs, both the, the, the summer schools and the conferences and the literary programs and the, freedom, and the human rights programs. So um, you, you just invite them, you give them the same as you give to the people from, I don't know, France or England, wh whoever comes to Villa. We, I never, I never um, stigmatize, you know, the, the people. I never organize ghetto kind of uh, programs for the Belarus only, or for um, Ukraine only, or for, I don't know, Polish only. I don't want this, this special treatment. I want these young people to meet in the inter intercultural environment to meet other peers from, uh, from other countries so that they 
get the same message as my colleague, my young colleagues from you know, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, and and uh, Germany. So they are participants. They are participating on equal grounds. I don't want any special program for them because I think this this can be also destructive in a way. Uh, there has been a lot of criticism uh, in Poland about overdoing the scholarships, too many scholarships. We almost took all the young intelligentsia to Poland, you know. Um, and I agree with this criticism because it is not, you know, just giving for, sorry, for nothing. It's not, it's not good. When we give, when we, we, when we invite people, we ask them to participate to, and we hope that they will start uh, a new cooperation without us, with with the people who, whom they meet during our programs. So participa yes, participation on equal grounds, not special treatment. They are not sacred cows, you know. No. <laughs> Thanks. Second round of questions and comments. Here I see first and then third and then second and third. Be be before you say just an experiment, could you raise your hands who are involved or have been involved in a, a sort of civil society or civic activism. Could you raise who? Almost everybody. Yeah. Almost everyone, yes. <laughs> Thanks. OK, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lucian Zell. I'm a Prague-based poet from California. And uh, I want to, to bring into the conversation uh, the beautiful citation from the poet Shelley, who declared that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And I think that our world has few artists, but unfortunately, even fewer artists, people who not only present their personal opinion through their art, but who take on the mantle of power that can come through being an expression of the collective unconscious. So I, I want to ask you, Joan, because I think you definitely did take on that mantle, uh, to comment both on the little victories that you've had and also the huge defeats, and whether you think it would be possible in the future, since we're planting seeds here in this forum, to not only have a Peace Corps that Kennedy started, but to have some kind of art core where artists could, could actually use the weapons of paintbrushes and the beautiful uh, creative weapons that, that bring souls together instead of the bombs that we talk about dropping that are just going to tear bodies apart. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I think there are lots of people who are painting with more than just the paintbrush and the paint. I think it's a very simple question, again, of how you make community of those people to get them empowered with each other and in the world, and then it becomes more and more visible and, and become more and more of a force. Um, again, it's these times, I can only speak for the States because I've been living there, when we feel divided, I, years and years ago, after the big Woodstock and after the 60s and after the war in Vietnam, and a young man came up about probably 10 years later. He was 16. And he said, man, I missed it all. You know, I missed the music. <laughs> I missed the war. I mean, it, it's, all, it's all lumped together for him. And, and I said, well, didn't you have some of these things? Well, he did. He said, we don't have the glue. <laughs> and it's a kind of a glue that I think will make things more obvious, things that already exist, if they have each other to build upon. Um, I guess I'm saying that I think there is more heart, um, more art, more music. Um, it may not be of that extraordinary 10-year period that, that brought out Beatles and Dylan and Rolling Stones and you know, this extraordinary sort of rush, perfect storm of things. But I think that it exists, and it, it needs its platform back. 
and it doesn't happen like that. Something, something has to ignite, in my opinion. And that's what I felt, again, when Obama was speaking and running, was that, that we had the glue. So part of it is to do with building glue, I guess. Not sure. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Monica Neubauer, and I'm from the United States, and my question is for you, Mr. Lopez. As you've been on this journey in a country that has been very difficult to be on the journey you're on in, what are the parts of your journey? Where have you seen hope to encourage you to continue in your journey? And thank you for your journey and continuing to fight. But where, where have you seen hope and the encouragement to keep going and keep moving forward? Well, I thank that question because I'm always asked why, why we continue. And the first answer is we need to see, really, we need to see change happening. We need to co be convinced ourselves that that will happen in our lifetime. And I agree with Michael. I, I really think that that's a debate that needs to take place, that is the, the timely horizon. Because there are different views, as I said earlier. Some people say time will come and the time of God is perfect. And if that's 50 years, it's 50 years. Let's and just I try to do it while I'm still uh, alive, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that we need, to, we need to be convinced that that is a possibility. We also get a lot of uh, energy and a lot of conviction from people that get organized around different issues. And there, have, there has been, over this 14-year period, we have been very close at times to make about a uh, significant change. But we have had little victories. Mm -hmm. For example, I was mayor for eight years. And I was mayor of the capital in Venezuela. And we were able to build schools. We were able to build a healthcare system. We were able to brought about uh, a declining, significantly declining rate in, uh, in, public, um, in, in public safety. Uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, in, in delinquency, homicides rates. So we built things, we built markets, and, and we were able to put together a tax proposal that was good enough to have more economic activity and to finance all these issues. So that was a source of, of seeing things happening. But then I was running to become the governor of the city of Caracas. I had 70% of the vote, and the government sent a, a note saying no, that I couldn't run. While in the middle of the campaign, they just said, no, you're disqualified to run. You cannot run for office. And I was disqualified for a six-year period of time. So I had to go to the Human Rights Court, and we, went, we were there for five years, litigation. And then we won against the state. And the week after we won, the government said, we are leaving the court. And that happened last week. Uh, it was a year period, and the government said, we're leaving the Human Rights Inter-American Court. And then... We, we came back and uh, the, the electoral board said, okay, you can run. But then three days after that, the judicial system, they made a sentence with my case and they said, okay, you can run, but if you win, you cannot govern. <laughs> so I, I said, you know, this, is, this, this was a source, of course, of obstacles and, and, and continuous obstacles. But we put together a political movement, grassroots political movement, and that's where we get or all of our source of hope in, in seeing people. People that have day-to-day -day more difficulties than, than we have, and they overcome those difficulties. And even though they have all those difficulties, they're willing to put together a social and a political movement to bring about change. From the tiny things that they can do in their communities to the big things that we are proposing, which is all the rights for all the people. And we're proposing a complete change in our country. I was talking to my Cuban friends this morning. Timely, I mean, they have had 54 years fighting against the same obstacle. I don't want to wait 54 years. So the proposal <laughs> we're making our people is uh, we need to have complete change. And what's complete change? Change in the president? No. We need to change the system. And I was talking to President Declare this morning, and he said our fight was against the system. And his view of the system was a constitution. Today, our view of changing the system is to bring about change of who is managing the state. So we need to give, give people the possibility to link their own very clear problems, very day-to-day -day problems that they have that needs to be linked to who's running the judiciary, who
who's running the, 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 the Attorney General's office, who's running the People's Defense Office, who's running the National Assembly. We need to make constant links. You cannot find food, and that's the, their responsibility. We need to bring about change. You don't have public safety, it's their responsibility. We need to bring about change. You don't have um, the possibility to have a job, to progress, to get married and have a house, and, and, and basically to have a better life every day, and that's a responsibility of who's governing us. But we need to make the link with the small day-to-day -day things, because that's the only way that we can link the aspirations of millions of people <clears throat> to a single movement that has common, uh, common ground. Because people want change for different reasons, and we need to understand that. Not all the people want the same type of change. So we need to be very pluralistic about the offer of the type of change we have. Because it would be very selfish to say, well, I represent change. Elect me, and I'm change. And that would be very selfish. We need, to, we need to sell an idea. We need to present an idea that is strong enough that everybody will be willing to see themselves in that type of change, but it's strong enough for people to fight, to people to take risks, for people to say, I'm willing to step forward, to people to say, I'm willing to step forward and I'm so convinced about what I'm doing that I'm inviting other people to come with me with my actions. I lead by example. So um, I think that there are many, many reasons to, to be optimistic. And our main <coughs> duty, our main job, being political, social leaders, is to be optimistic. The day we lose optimism, we, we, we should do something else. Because it's impossible to lead if you're not optimistic about what you, where you're leading to. And I always tell the people that we work with that, that, that we need to be optimistic. I mean, if it's dark, you need to tell people that it's going to get brighter. You cannot tell people it's dark and just moan about the fact that it's dark, you know? And many, many politicians just go into that trap and just uh, identify the things that are wrong. And we need to go beyond that. And I think that that's the source of maintaining people with a short hope, short-term hope, that I think is very important. And I've said this idea several times already. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Time is ruthless, so our panel, if you like it or not, slowly goes to its end. If there is a person who really wants to say his or her comment or ask the question, so please do it. Uh, those who will be so kind and not to do it, they can discuss it then. I, I see you, yes. Please, there. In the last row. Yeah. Uh, there, then there are two of you. Three. Uh, I'm, then there are three Four. of you, but, yeah, okay, there are three of you. Uh, the, the lady at the last row, for, first, yes? Yeah. I'm Susanna from Burma, Myanmar. Please, be so kind, brief, yes? Yeah. So when we are talking about CSO, in our country we have two kinds of CSO, real CSO and fake CSO. We call GONGO, Government Organized NGO. And then these, we have to struggle with this difference. So uh, I would like to ask, uh, do you have that kind of situation in your um, community, in your country, especially I think uh, China? Do you have that kind of gone go? Who back up government and then interfere the real CSO? Thank you very much. Yes, so it's a very well known strategy of authoritarian governments to create their own fake or false organizations which are undermining the genuine activity. Yes, but I just very quick to answer these questions. Yeah. This question is look like the fake NGO sometimes will damage the civil society. But eventually it turns out if you are from the government, you don't want to do your job. In the competition of NGOs, fake NGO always stop at the very beginning, just doing some very pretentious job, because the other NGOs, which is real, really want to convince the people. And this is the internet world, social media world. For example, if you are fake NGO, nobody follow your social media account. You only have zero or 10, but the other social media, the social media account of an NGO, a real NGO, you will have millions of followers. So sometimes, uh, just let them do. You're, okay, 
basically they are doing that, at least they're doing that in the NGO form. Because if you government accept doing that in the NGO form, that means you accept the rule, the game, the rule of the game. But the rule of the game will always let the real NGO win. Because this is the social media, well, social media 2.0 world. Everyone have the cell phone to say yes to the real NGOs. I could just offer another useful perspective how to use internet. Yes, please, there is. And then you, okay? Thank you. I'm Daniela Richterova. Uh, I work for the Slovak Atlantic Commission in Bratislava. Um, some of you um, have mentioned that art is very important for civil society and that it can empower civil movements. And I think it's been a case in uh, many countries that the panelists represent. And uh, Ms. Baez is a living example of that. So I'm wondering what, what you think, uh, not just Ms. Baez, but, but uh, whoever wishes to speak about cultural um, uh, protests um, when uh, artists don't want to go to countries uh, that are totalitarian or where they disagree with the regimes. What do you think about boycotts of uh, countries like Israel or other countries like South Africa uh, 20 years ago? Do you think it helps the civil society? Do you think it um, undermines their cause? What do you think is the effect when artists refuse to go and support um, civil society movements in certain countries? There is even a person who would like to respond. Would you like to respond, Michael? No, 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 sorry. So, who? who? Yeah, um, I think it's, I don't, I don't think there's a, a single line. I mean, I think, for instance, when Paul Simon went into South Africa and he was terribly criticized and um, was worried about it. I mean, he's not a political guy. Um, had, I done, had he done the wrong thing? And then he came out with this extraordinary music. So, I don't know who we judge or... I personally haven't, you know, broken bands because it it was uncomfortable for me. But I <clears throat> I wouldn't want to condemn somebody if there was something that they could do that would make a difference. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Also, a really short comments. Uh, Antonio Rodriguez, I am from Cuba. And in general, I am optimistic in relation with the change in my country, even if we have been 54 years <laughs> under that regime. But today, I feel more optimistic. <laughs> and I really want to thank to the organizers of the forum, because we can share all these uh, uh, comments, ideas, visions, especially because I, I can realize that people from different places think in the same way. And they <laughs> thank you. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not going to make any special conclusions. I'd like just to point at something what was said by the panelists. That concept of glue, which is so important and crucial for creating and nurturing communities, it is something what also Dallendorf was talking about when he said that ideas like markets are cold ideas and something else is also necessary, not only just those cold ideas to create civic bonds. Uh, secondly, uh, you so very appropriately describe this eagerness and this desire for tangible goals. And at the same time, you're sitting here and discussing here with the words and heritage of this man who, in his concept of hope, was not talking only about of immediately or predictable, achievable gains. He was talking about the hope as an orientation of the heart, about something what is internal in soul, about the hope which is not the forecast, not the prediction. It means it's a hope that it doesn't immediately have to bring the visible and and the tangible results, but at the same time, it is still there. Sometimes it's hard to achieve tangible goals, but what is extraordinarily important is to keep and preserve hope in our hearts. Third, Michael, with everything what you said, and again, how empowering tigers, but also about 
how the potential of your country could be br somehow disseminated in the world, and not only talking about China, if we imagine that the China, which now in the third world is perceived as a country which is bringing money and building and so on, that you would bring at least one hundredth of that energy and that <laughs> potential which you embodied, I think it would be, and I hope it will be, a, uh, another fascinating contribution of China and of, of, of Chinese society to, to the global society and to the mankind. And finally, I promised you this is going to be a fascinating panel. In the old days, <clears throat> Joan was involved in a campaign. It was Vietnam Times draft military. And the campaign at that time had a slightly politically incorrect slogan. It means that the good girls <laughs> are saying yes to the boys who are saying no, the boys who are saying no to Vietnam. It was modified in 20, 2008, and it was talking about those who are saying yes to people who are saying yes to Obama. Mm -hmm. When we designed this panel, we changed uh, the first version of its title, Civil Society, a Positive Force, to a question. Civil Society is still a positive force? And I think both good guys and good girls can say <laughs> that uh, civil society is really a good thing. I thank you for your contribution, and I think our panelists for a great job. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you.